you can watch all you want on YouTube and, and whatnot in concerts, but it's not the same, right? The energy yeah. that comes off the stage from the performance performers. Yeah, there's something about it. And you know what? It, you have that effect on people when they go, they come and see you play. People are just, they're, they're inspired. They're moved. They're, they're, it, it's all of that. So, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So um, let's continue a little bit forward. So what happened? So after you're, you're playing, you took, you took some early lessons. What happened and how did you develop into playing professionally? Um, I think, uh, yeah. So it, when I got out of high school, I, I got this gig with this Japanese band called the Flower Traveling Band. They came over from Japan. Lighthouse brought them over from Japan because they had done a gig t um, together in, at uh, Expo something or other, 71. I don't know. But anyway. Um, so they came over, their drummer got TV. So all of a sudden Lou Williams was a Terrible. Japanese band and they need a drummer. So anyway, I auditioned, I got the gig. So to, for me, that was, I was just fresh out of high school. This was the big time. They paid me $60 a week and I, and I moved out of my parents' place, got a little room in a house down on, in Parkdale. I thought this is it. I've made it, you know, but anyway, so that started, I never stopped like playing in band. Like that's what I did. and the rest of my life like and it was a tough goal and I had to move back home a couple of times but I just went started playing in different bands and um I mean nothing really well like around 74 I, I joined a band called Truck and then from that band I joined another band called Devotion it was a prog rock both those bands were sort of prog rock things Devotion especially wow but that was great you know uh fantastic uh playing and with them and everything but then like I, I didn't the first big gig I got really was um, Dominic Triano in 1977. Yep. yep. That, was a, that was a gig that um, was highly coveted in Toronto. And I kind of, I, I had auditioned for that a few times and uh, I was just so nervous that I blew it every time. But Do Dominic had faith in me somehow. And one day he just showed up at my door and he said, you got the gig whether you want it or not. So I went, okay. So I was 24 at the time. And, um, and then, so all of a sudden I'm doing live radio shows and doing um concerts opening for tower power and and then um and then recording like for capital records my first major album and um oh i have to, i have a story about that too yeah um, i was using gretsch drums and i had i had my clear ambassadors on the drums uh, as like i always did and they sounded great and but then being a young mm -hmm. idiot i uh in downbeat magazine it said uh remo controlled sound drum heads the drum head for recording. So I got I got rid of all the clear ambassadors and put black dots on all my toms. I show up at the studio. We spent all day trying to get a drum sound. It just sounded, they didn't sound good. I mean, those drums sound, there's a certain sound, like Tony Williams, you crank them, and it's, but it wasn't yep. for a rock band at that time. So yep. this was in the 70s, and, and, and it was a bit of a deader sound. Like, yeah. It, it, anyway, it was all wrong. So the... Uh, Harry Brown was producing, and he said, you got to get some different heads. So I had to get my buddy who owned Toronto Percussion Center to open up his store on Sunday morning and get me some clear ambassadors and mm -hmm. uh, put them on the drums and tune them up. And then but from then in, it was okay. But, oh, my God, I lived and died a thousand deaths, you know, like because oh. I had done things thinking I was doing the right thing. And it was like, oh, it was bad. But anyway. Yeah. Well, you live and learn, right? You live and learn. The hard what, what was the drum kit that you had in the studio there? Uh, Do you remember, or was it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, by that time, I had uh, my original kit had a twenty, but I had bought a twenty-two because I wanted a big. So it was twenty-two, like twelve, thirteen, six. <laughs> that was it. Twelve, thirteen, sixteen. No, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen. Because I had bought the fourteen. Yeah. So that that was it. Twelve, thirteen. On, on the little promo clip there with with Kim. Looks like you had the three rack toms. Was it the three or was it, um, did you often, with Kim Mitchell, sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Did you use the three rack toms as well or just the two up front? Three. Um, the big okay. yellow I played with Kim was 10, 12, 13 up above and then 14, 16, 18 on the floor. And um, until sound men yelled at me so much about the 18 rumbling <laughs> around the, the bass and everything, I just got rid of it. But um, uh, I'm back to it now though. 
But uh, no, that all we are video. I'm using Dave Ketchum's drums, the drummer from Coney Hatch. See, we were on the road at that time with Kim, with, with Brian Adams in the States, and all our gear was down there. But we had to do a video for the car, so we flew home, and I borrowed those white Gretsch drums uh, from him. And he, they're, so he had, they're great drums. They were 12, 13, 14, 16 with the 24. And so that's what I used for that video. Um, but um, yeah, uh, those, those were nice drums, too. Those white eight, drums are nice. I have some white ones now, uh, too. Uh, yeah, I, I re recovered. I bought an old kit last year and recovered them in white because I, I always love the look of white Gretsch drums. So, pretty yes, good. They, they look good. That's this is awesome. Okay, so when you were playing, and oh, and just just to to mention, when you did the had the Dominic Triano gig, my mm -hmm. friend who wishes to remain anonymous actually bought his '64 Strat maybe a couple of months ago. So it was. It came up for sale, and my friend bought. Don, he wanted me to let you know that uh, it's in good care, and uh, yeah. So and he, it's an amazing guitar. Cool. So what was next for you? After Dominic, okay. So um, oh, I played with this guy Dave Bendis for a while, and it was a ah. fusion. Band. I play all Jeff Beck, and um, it was sort of the rockier fusion stuff. But uh, yeah, it was a great band. <laughs> Uh, so I was doing that right at the tail end of um, Dominic. And uh, and what had happened was the Dominic trial had, uh, op we opened for Max Webster in London. And uh, Kim was watching by the stage and he thought, eh, I like the way that guy plays. So then, but things went along and went along. And then around 1981, I think, Kim phoned me up out of the blue and said, by this time he had split up Max Webster and he said, do you want to come and, play with me and I went yeah let's you know so he came and he picked me up with my drums and I thought we were going to go to a rehearsal place and rehearse something. he takes me with the United Media Studios and we started recording right away so we recorded demos of Kids in Action and Chain of Events and a couple of other tunes that never were on albums that demo if, uh, if I had a tape of that uh, that was the best thing I ever recorded with Kim it was magical it was fantastic the Kids in Action and Chain of Events that we recorded that day were way better than what was on the album. And the album was pretty good, but uh, but um, Kim says he found the two inch tape of that, but he has to get it baked before, you know, cause they disintegrate. Right. So he's, I keep bugging him to do that. Cause I got to hear that thing again. But yeah, so that was my first experience. The engineer played bass and Kim and I just rocked out on this stuff. It was great, you know? So, so then I dragged, <laughs> I dragged Bob Wilson, the bass player from uh, Dominic's band. I dragged him into Kim's thing and then, um, I don't know how Peter Fordette and Paul Butler from Ottawa, I don't know how they ended up on that first EP, like how they ended up working on it. I don't even remember that. Um, that's weird. But anyway, so so Peter came along and this guy, Paul Butler, but then Paul was another guitar player, but then we decided it was going to be a four piece. So, so it was yeah. Peter and <clears throat> him. But uh, so then that started that whole thing. And that was um, uh, five years. Yeah, five years. Um, and a lot of touring and recording and mayhem mm -hmm. and and that's well, when I ordered. Uh, I was playing a mahogany set, a, two, a set I had refinished um, uh, of Gretsch when I joined up with Kim. But then I ordered the big yellow set, um, uh, and uh, because I knew I needed some some drums with some oomph in them, so so I got the um, those eighties. As far as I'm concerned, those eighties Gretsch drums, early eighties, not later eighties, early eighties Gretsch drums are the best drums. Uh, the Gretsch ever made, and I, I still, I own a whole pile of them now, and I keep uh, buying them because uh, those, those shells were special, and the quality control at that time was great. Uh, years later, I put my big yellow kit in on um, on a, a ebony kit in eighty six, eighty seven, I think. Yeah, some showed up, and it wasn't the same. Things, something had gone wrong. Like, like I mean, they were okay, they were good, but this guy, I think, it was. Uh, Charlie Roy, who joined Yoi. Gretchen, yep, and made everything great. And there was new hardware, and he he yep. did it all. And he when he left, things kind of went south a little bit for a little while. And I the drums still sounded good and everything, but I just looked the, the look of the show and everything. It was it was just a bit, and there was a few problems that, that were they never had before. So, um, but yeah, so those early eighty scratch drums. Uh, if you get the ones where the uh, the silver paint goes over the bearing edge, you know you got the early 80s yeah. ones. 
my first Gretsch kit I bought from Toronto Percussion. It was in the cymbal room, cymbal testing room, with the little 8, 10, 13, little 18-inch bass drum. I bought it, and they had that. I, I That used to bother me. I thought, oh, man, this is not very good. Those drums sounded unbelievable. It didn't matter what room they were in. They just sounded so great. Everybody that played them. I went all over Toronto looking for my first drum kit, and I fell in love with, well, first of all, I played them and went, what? And then I saw them, and then I bought them for $1,050. Wow. And that was with a collar lock rack, so it was 810, a 13 by 11 on a stand, 18 by 14 bass drum in walnut finish, and right. um, I missed that drum kit. I don't have it. And here is the poster behind me here that it had laminated. And Charlie Roy is up in the corner. He was around, I guess, when the Centennial Drums. That's right. Uh, 100th anniversary. Those. Have you ever played any of those? No, I would. Uh, some of those are. There's, there's one. There's Carpathian Elm kit. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. Yeah, I've seen Picaro in the studio. Pictures of that of uh, yeah. with one of those kits. I think it might have probably been Paul Jameson's uh, backline kit or kit that he could. But yeah, they'd be neat. And you see them on eBay every now and again, the snares, the 8x14s, and you need to see what they're saying. They sound like now. Rab. Hi, Johnny Rab. Hey, Johnny Rab's on here? Yeah, coolest guy right. ever. My friend. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I talked to Johnny the other day on the phone. What an awesome guy and an awesome drummer. Holy smokes. All you guys that make me want to inspire me to practice. Um, any other questions here that we can answer? Anybody right in?